So I am going to introduce our next two speakers, uh, and I'm going to introduce them both now, just in the interest of time. And uh, then uh, I'll come back and, and give you instructions about lunch. So um, I, I know that the next two speakers will build on the fabulous momentum that Mark started for us this morning and uh, I'm excited to hear them. Our first speaker, Gracie Kavner, divides her time between Houston, Texas and Woodstock, Vermont. She is the founder of the Recipe for Success Foundation, the largest nutrition education program of its kind in the country. Nationally respected, nationally known, great website, I recommend it. Um, Gracie served as an advisor to First Lady Michelle Obama in, uh, on the Let's Move Task Force and was asked to roll Recipe for Success out nationally. Um, she also has as a sub-component of Recipe for Success the Seed to Plate Nutrition Education Program, which reaches out to schools across the country with a Train the Trainer certification, uh, curriculum support to connect children with healthy food. Uh, Gracie has had a, a variety of careers, architecture, hospitality, marketing, public relations, and she published a cookbook for children with the great title of Eat It, Food Adventures with Marco Polo. After we hear from Gracie, we will hear from Dr. Darla Castelli. Uh, who is with us from the University of Texas at Austin. She's been working with school-age kids in physical activity settings for more than 20 years. She is currently an associate professor at the University of Texas. She has her master's from Northern Illinois University in exercise physiology. She taught health and phys ed. She's actually married to a phys ed teacher um, in the Austin School District, and she says he, he keeps her grounded and out of her ivory tower. Um, she got her PhD from the University of South Carolina, and she has been uh, spent much of the last uh, years of her career investigating the effects of physical activity and fitness on motor competency and cognitive skills in children. Her research suggests, and you'll hear this from her directly, that better physical fitness and more physical activity have, go figure, a positive influence on cognitive processing, including academic achievement and better decision making. So first Gracie and then Darla. Well, I don't know about you, but Mark, I, I think I got my 30 minutes in just watching you. Right? And I'll just go ahead and let you all know that I have a broken foot, so I'm not going to be hopping around the stage. I'll have to stay right here, but know that in spirit I'm hopping around the stage because you know what? I have passion. And I bet you have passion too. Is it your passion that brought you here today? It is for me. It's my passion that gets me up every single day of the year. My passion is food. I love it. <laughs> Real food. For my own consumption, that's come to mean locally grown, pesticide free, just picked, fresh fruits and vegetables, and free ranging critters. Usually grown by someone I know, quite often me. For my neighbors, I think of shortening the path between field and plate and encouraging everyone to develop an understanding and a respect for the essence of real food. <laughs> My passion for good food has picked up sisters and cousins along the way. Organics, food justice, truth in advertising, family farms, shared meals, urban agriculture, and farmers markets. 
Real food has a big family, and I love them all. I have to admit that this passion, it snuck up on me. One day, and I have to admit, I'm 60, so you know, I grew up uh, in when astronauts were just, uh, we were all excited about it. I grew up begging for Tang. <laughs> It was the drink of the astronauts, right? The next thing you know, I'm asking at the farmer's market, just how far away did you, from town did you grow this arugula? I want to know about your carbon footprint. Passion is often unplanned. An epiphany sparked by everyday sorts of experiences, but harnessed, passion can change the world. And that's what I'm trying to do, one bite at a time. I grew up in the 1950s. Back then, if something was worth eating, you could fit it between two slices of Wonder Bread. My mother was raised in the country, but she abandoned Green Acres for the big old city of San Antonio, and she never looked back. She fancied herself avant-garde. She was enamored with convenience foods, canned and powdered, that meant sophisticated. Fast food was actually at the very tip of the women's lib spear. We didn't call it women's lib back in the 60s, but right along with washing machines and every other modern convenience that gave women an ounce of their time back and freed them from spending all day in the kitchen. We all know there have been unintended consequences. Even though my own mom admitted that processed foods couldn't hold a candle to the taste of fresh produce that she grew up eating on the farm, it didn't matter. We ate canned green beans and fruit cocktail and fresh frozen fish sticks. Salad? That would be a wedge of iceberg because, you know what? We were modern. I mean, we had the Naga Hide sofa to prove it. It was what? The aluminum Christmas tree. Okay, who remembers those, right? <laughs> Do you love it that they're back now, that the kids are like, ooh, aluminum Christmas trees? <laughs> it was my dad who finally insisted on a garden, that Luddite. <laughs> I was about nine when he gave me my first nip of real food. Just harvested sweet corn, right off the cob. I didn't even cook it. But I was hooked. I could not get enough. I learned to cook straight from the garden and took over making dinner. Move over, Mom. You wanted to get out of the kitchen? I'm kicking you out. Pandora was out of the box, and there was no going back. There was another rule, little rule in my family that was motivating. If you cooked a dinner, you didn't have to clean up, and I really didn't like to wash dishes. So um, you found me in the kitchen cooking all the time. I wanted more. Julia Child captured my imagination. I read Mastering the Art of French Cooking like a novel and never missed her show on PBS. I could do that Ackroyd imitation <laughs> later. <laughs> I eventually went to cooking school in Paris myself, became a part sometime caterer and a full-time enthusiastic thrower of dinner parties. Hey, I wasn't totally hooked. After all, I'm from Texas. I still bought ranch-style beans and frozen veggies, and I loved Whataburger. I joked about Velveeta, but always made the queso with it because, you know, that's what we did. I never lectured my friends and family, and I never refused Thanksgiving green beans from my aunt that swam in cream of mushroom soup. Okay, who grew up with that? Everything was dressed in cream of mushroom soup or the uh, uh, canned uh, fried onion rings, right? That was always on the top. Fabulous fresh food to me was a celebration of life, a hobby like macrame. It wasn't a political position. It was all about the taste. But life changed when I had my son. That was in the early 70s. Food was in the news. Boycotts, meat boycotts, chemicals, aspar aspartame, I always mispronounce it, was in baby food that hit the headlines like a bomb. And then shocking reports that those innocent looking jars of beech nut and gerbers were made of 90% sugar. 
It was the early 70s, I discovered that the world of chemistry had overtaken the simply canned food of my childhood. Canned food was no longer what I grew up with. It was a whole different animal. And the results could not be assumed innocuous. My protective maternal instincts drove my decision to abandon commercial baby food. I was one of those hippie moms. Every single processed food was declared off limits in my kitchen. Cooking from scratch was the way we rolled 24-7. Whatever I made for dinner, no matter how spicy or how exotic, went right into the blender and was fed to the baby. I mean, after all, you know, did you ever wonder what everyone did for all those generations before beech nut changed our lives? There wasn't a thing he wouldn't eat. At three, he started helping out in the kitchen. As soon as he could stand up and roll out uh, the pasta dough, he was there. He never realized that other kids put sugar in their cereal or that they ate tricks instead of oatmeal. His TV time was limited to his daily dose of Sesame Street, so he didn't demand Happy Meal toys because he didn't even know about them. He was nine before he drank his first Coca-Cola. That was on a sleepover. I couldn't protect him there. He didn't like it. He did not like it because he had not grown up drinking it. Food rules were easy enough to maintain because food marketing did not penetrate my household. I wasn't too concerned with the rest of the world, just my own kids. It was in the mid-90s, after they were grown and gone, I did not have a dog in the hunt anymore, you could say, when I discovered just how out of control things had become out there in the big old world. Junk food marketing was invading elementary schools, not just in hallway vending machines, but as we all know, on the lunch line. Food in schools has always been controversial. Started in 1946, I mean, someone mentioned about earlier about the military situation. School lunch was started in 1946 in response to the nutritional deficiencies of the U.S. military recruits. Those boys were showing up starving to death. It soon became embroiled, of course, in a serial struggle among food companies, drink companies, farmers, agribusiness, school administrators, and nutritionists. They fought over who could regulate what, where, what, and when. There was a lot of money at stake. Remember the ketchup and pickle relish controversy of the 1980s? Remember when ketchup was deemed a vegetable on the school lunch menu? Who remembers that? You might have been kids, you're all young, you might have been kids at the time. That was small potatoes compared to the efforts made by the soda industry to break into the lunch line. In 1983, acting on a suit brought by the National Soft Drink Association, thank you, a panel of judges ruled that the USDA could regulate drinks only in public school cafeterias themselves and only at mealtimes. As long as a soft drink and candy companies had the permission of a local school board and administrators, they could sell anything, anytime, or any place else. Vending machines began to multiply like bunnies in the hallways and gymnasiums of our schools. I knew about the cartoons, the toys, the cross-marketing that motivated the tiniest tot to demand sugary cereal and chicken nuggets. That was bad enough. But even if she limited TV, a mom could no longer shield her kids from junk food access. No matter what the home rule, a five-year-old with money in his pocket could buy his own Cokes right there at school, and he could have chips for lunch and skip the lunch line. And what a coup for Pepsi and Coke. Who knows a little bit about marketing here? Anybody ever heard of a cradle-to-grave customer? That's what everybody shoots for, and what better time to snag your cradle-to-grave customer than at five years old or seven years old, because your first soft drink will be your soft drink for life. I was livid. At first, I focused on protecting young children 
from that soft drink advertising, the junk food advertising, when they were from out of mom's sight. I simply wanted parents to have control, so I worked to get the vending machines out of elementary schools. My research during this effort, oh, let me just back up and say, Texas was, believe it or not, as much as you think we're behind the curve, Texas was one of the first states in America to uh, implement policy banning vending machines from elementary schools and limiting access in high school. But what I found when I was researching was this hidden thing that nobody was talking about in the mid-90s. No one. In fact, you know, I was a crazy lady at the cocktail party going on and on. But now, thanks to the First Lady and so many change agents, it's on everyone's mind and plastered across the news. And you know what that problem is. We are suffering from the explosive effects of a spiraling epidemic. In fact, obesity has now eclipsed smoking as America's number one health ha hazard. I'm preaching to the choir, I know, but just to reinforce, between 1980 and 2010, obesity rates have doubled and then some. Today, more than two-thirds of American adults are overweight or obese. Montana is one of the thinner states. Congratulations. Only 61.7% of the, your total population is seriously overweight, overweight or obese, but sadly, 11.8% of your kids are already clinically obese. As a nation, I love this, we need to lose 4.6 billion pounds. Boy, talk about that. That's going to be a challenge, right? Uphill. Research predicted that by 2030, over 40% of all Americans are on track to be morbidly obese. Morbidly obese, that's you know, beyond the pale. 2030, I think about how fast the last 15 years have gone. I mean, 2030, that is just the blink of an eye. The crisis has invaded our children's lives. 23 million American kids today are significantly overweight or already obese. You know what I'm talking about, it's not baby fat and cute pudgy arms. I'm talking clinically obese four-year-olds. Unless we get control, this will be the first generation of kids, as you've heard already twice today, but I'm gonna say it again, that don't outlive their parents. Let me be clear, they may die before they even reach 55. Uh, at 55, I still thought of as a kid. And you know, life is just beginning, right? <laughs> Remember how school lunch was originally designed to ensure that we had healthy boys who could be soldiers? And now the US military complains that recruits are so overweight that it's a threat to national security? It's just not fat weighing us down, it's the financial burden is, it's amazingly heavy. Weight-related issues cost the country 270 billion, again with a B, dollars in 2010, four times what it cost us just 10 years ago. 190 billion of that is direct medical cost, up from 11 billion, which took our breath away in 2000. 42% it cost 20 sorry it cost us 42% more to take care of the obesity related chronic diseases of an obese person than providing care to a healthy weight person 42% more i call it it's like the rabbit coming down the python it's choking our healthcare system costs are expanding as fast as our waistlines with projections of economic impact in 2030 to be 390 billion. I have to just say, dollars might not register because you know once you get it into the stratosphere, it's like, uh-huh. But um, I had some emergency surgery uh, this past summer, and I live very, you heard I live part of the time in Vermont, and I live very close to fabulous medical center, uh, Dartmouth Hitchcock. 
And uh, after I came out of surgery, I found myself in the PD ward, and I thought, well, I've always been a child at heart, so you know, maybe they just kind of knew that. Um, and uh, when I sort of came out of it, and the nurse was visiting with me, and she just there'd just been a little story in the family circle about me, and she kind of recognized me, and and so she was been in my ear, you know, about my work, and she said, "We're seeing it right here. Do you wonder why you're in the pediatric ward? All of our beds are full, most of them with chronic disease. So you stay healthy, stay real healthy, because better better hope you don't have to go to the hospital." That's all I have to say about that one. So I'm um, staying real healthy myself now. The saddest thing I learned, though, in all of this work, in all of this discovery process of mine, is that obesity is a stealth killer. These 23 million kids, the ones with a problem today, they have a much higher risk of type 2 diabetes, which we all hear about, but how about hypertension, heart disease, arthritis, liver disease, kidney failure, cancer. These diseases are not striking in middle age, they're striking them now as young as six years old, six year old babies with adult chronic diseases that they will have to deal with for life. Chronic diseases that kick in this early will keep millions of this generation out of the workforce and it will kill them young. There are plenty of contributing factors that exacerbate this problem, and you heard about many of them from Mark, but I learned that the core of the cause is what we eat and how we eat it. We're talking about food, my passion. That got my attention. So in the mid-90s, I began to unravel the remarkable changes in our food system during the last 40 years. The industrialization of farming, an explosion in the snack food industry, and the ensuing sophistication of manipulated food. The multi-layer processing of the simplest food items. The design of a food distribution system that valued ease of shipping over all other factors. Farm subsidies, launched 35 years ago to feed a hungry nation, triggered a profusion of cheap corn. Cheap corn syrup ignited an explosion of processed foods. And cheap corn feed created a new paradigm for livestock farming that flooded the market with inexpensive, low-quality meats. Cut-rate ingredients have drove a profusion of high profit products for a few powerful manufacturing businesses and fast food chains. Did you know that we have 10,000 new products every year introduced into the American market? How many of you are gardeners and farmers? Do you grow 10,000 products? I don't think so. Today's diet is not about fresh fruits and vegetables harvested in season, distributed locally, and prepared from scratch at home. Nope. Most American diets consist of high calorie, high sugar food made of compelling flavors and few nutrients. It's all dressed up as convenience or coolness personified and marketed 24-7. In fact, one-third of Americans eat fast food every single day. Okay, how many of you eat fast food every day? Once a week? All right. Factor that in, right? You're averaged with this other number. That means lots and lots of folks, lots more than once a day. 70% of our kids consume a sugary drink every day. Okay, I grew up Coke, you know, I love the little bitty bottles of Coke. They were in the vending machines at the airport, I remember. It was a big treat. I got a Coke about, a little, what, eight ounce Coke, um, maybe once every couple months. Not every day. And we know portion sizes have more than doubled. Everything is big gulp and supersized. You know what? 
This is what I think. I think this is a war. It's a complex war. We're not facing one enemy. From the powerful marketing influences of junk food makers to the sharp increase of television watching and processed food consumption, cultural shifts that devalue home cooking while making professional chefs multimedia entertainment. I never got that one. We will watch food being prepared on TV, but we won't make it ourselves. What is that about? and the demise of the family meal. The enemy is all around us, but you know what? We're complicit. Food companies know just how to make our mouths water. Talk about biochemistry. These new foods are not just easy to figure, are just not very easy to figure out. They look like we've, what we've always eaten. They look so innocuous, but they're dramatically different with added chemicals controlling everything from appearance to taste and smell in recipes designed to create a neurochemical addiction. What's in a food company's best interest? Selling food. What will help them sell food? You eating it. What will help them eat, sell more food? You eating more of it. That's their goal. Over time, these hyper-palatable foods actually change our brain chemistry in ways that drive us to overeat. Now we're learning that these added chemicals are not only driving the obesity epidemic, am I right about this? They're contributing to the rise of autism and all kinds of autoimmune diseases. We're going to hear about some of this later, I think. The way I look at it, if food is approved by the FDA, it's only guaranteed to not kill you immediately. To sell all this junk food, powerful media campaigns extol a new culture of eating that celebrates salty snacks, sweet drinks, and calorie-dense, nutritionally deficient fast food. Family meals shared around the dining table are usurped by high-speed living, constant grazing, the fast, easy drive-through window, over-processed heat and serve entrees, and personalized takeout orders snared on the run. Highly processed food is fun. It's fast. It's fashionable. And food marketing is bombarding us with that message at every single turn. There's no safe haven. Our kids see a junk food ad every five minutes during Saturday morning cartoons alone. Advertising triggers. Advertising is not innocuous. You know, it's a science. It's a psychological science. It triggers what psychologists call the brain's click whir response. Food advertising that promotes snacking, fun, happiness, and excitement directly contributes to the increased intake of fast food and junk. The tradition of sitting down to three family meals each day has melted into all day grazing. It's now socially acceptable to eat at any time. How many of you have spent any time at all in Europe? Um, particularly like France, Italy, do you see people just kind of going down the street with the big gulp and no. Even the school lunch program in Paris, the kids get a full three course meal and it's served in courses. They get an hour for lunch, by the way. No, we don't do it that way. How much, do we, how much time do we get for lunch now, our kids? Less than, in some schools, less than 15 minutes. And in some school, I live in a fourth largest city in America, our urban, very highly urban uh, school district, our so, schools are so overcrowded. We have some kids starting breakfast. You know how we talked about how it's good to have recess before lunch? Some of our kids are starting their lunch rotation at 10 in the morning. It's crazy. Most of us, though, we don't even know that this is a problem. We all love our french fries and our nuggets. What could be bad about convenience and flavor? Bombarded by deep pocket advertising campaigns launched by giant food companies, I knew that my fellow consumers 
were like lambs to the, sh to the slaughter, I call it, you know, because food is one of two elements of staying alive. You've got to eat and you've got to breathe, right? We take both of them for granted. They've become mindless operations. And it's been proven that both of them, with, when done with mindfulness, can make a whole better life for you, right? But we're, we are not mindful about our food. And then I had an idea. <laughs> it's actually starting to scare people around my hood when I say that um, it's second only to, I can do that. <laughs> it was that combination of words that launched Recipe for Success Foundation. You know, I never planned to spend my retirement in a 60 hour a week unpaid job. I had that eye on that apartment in Paris. <laughs> But when I discovered the acute problem of childhood obesity and realized that I was in a unique position to help, I knew what I had to do. I had to change the way our children eat. Through this journey, I've learned that every powerful action starts with just that, a flicker of inspiration, an idea. Grassroots movements that can mobilize thousands of teachers, parents, sponsors, politicians, and activists just like you all start with an idea that is followed with the passion to transform it into action. Do something. The power is in the follow through. At Recipe for Success Foundation, we are working to change the story of childhood obesity. We want a different ending. So we're translating research into action with hands-on classes that connect with real staying power. We're fighting marketing with marketing. Our programs put children in touch with their food from seed to plate, and we make it fun. We think kids probably ought to know that their food doesn't grow in the drive through window, that Twinkie, not a vegetable. Eating's not an option, right? But the way we eat is. We will each make more than a thousand eating decisions this year and for every year of our lives. Most of these decisions need to be good ones. So six years ago, we launched what we call our Seed to Plate Nutrition Education Program in Houston's elementary schools. Studies had shown, I did a lot of research about this before I started working in the field. Studies showed that kids who garden eat better. Kids who cook eat better. Duh. So we invade the schools. We celebrate food. We garden, we cook, we create a culture of health throughout the campus in every class. It's working. We see an average increase in fresh fruit and vegetable consumption after just one year of guess how much? How much do you think? Maybe 5%? Guess? Anybody have a guess? 30% increase in just one year. For those of you in interventions, you know, that's a, kind of, that's a big move of the needle. We start literally planting the seed with these kids in the garden that we build on school grounds filled with veggies. These gardens are big enough so that every classroom teacher has their own bed. Everyone has ownership of that garden. Then we work with the students and their teachers to weave the garden lessons into their regular core curriculum throughout the rest of their studies in math, science, language, arts. The gardens touch everything. Then there, right at the crossroads, at the very heart of what we do, the chefs are helping the kids connect the produce from their gardens to the food on their plate. Idea. Do. Together, we created a program, these chefs and I, I started out with 24 volunteer chefs on my board who would volunteer their time and kind of helicopter into the classroom like rock stars and do their thing while I was in the back, you know, making, it, making the show work. Um, now we have about over 80 all over the country. But together we created a program unique in the country. These professional chefs, uh, they, they teach 
I, mean, I really think of it as mentoring young children. They empower them to create healthy, yet, this is the key word, tasty snacks and meals for themselves. Our Chefs in Schools program actually was an um, inspiration for um, the Chefs Moves to Schools. So a bunch of us went up to D.C. To, for that shout out and a thousand chefs showed up from across the country on the White House lawn. It was so fun. We roll cooking carts right into the classroom and we lead the kids through monthly explorations of flavor. It's hands-on cooking. We begin with how taste buds work together. Who just heard that not very good study we were talking about last night that um, obese kids don't have any taste buds. And I venture to say obese kids have wiped their taste buds out with high salt and high fat foods. We turn taste buds on. And over the course of the year, we move, move around the entire food plate with easy to make recipes using produce the kids have picked fresh from their own garden. We do not do ants on a log. We don't do happy face pancakes. We make ratatouille and pesto, healthy whole wheat pizza. I mean, they are kids. But the point is we don't just teach these children how to follow a written recipe, but the very essence of how to make healthy food yummy with dishes they will eat their entire lives. So the children learn the entire cycle of food. They plant the carrot seed. They tend the carrot, they harvest the carrots, they make carrot soup with their class, then they gather around the dining table with their class and eat that carrot soup together. We slip in skills like how to read a nutrition label and how to tell the difference between a marketing message and the facts. They learn hands-on how commercial chicken nuggets are made, and it's not a pretty picture. And what's really in a hot pocket, 87 unpronounceable ingredients. Along the way, they learn teamwork, sharing, etiquette, plus a little math, science, creative writing. By making it fun, we instill a lifelong enthusiasm for fresh fruits and vegetables and a respect for real food. While we're preparing the consumers of tomorrow to make good decisions, we're working with the community to give them better choices. From school lunch to PE, safe sidewalks to more grocery stores. And that's what's important, collaborating to work together to build holistic solutions that permeate your entire community, that not siloing, not working in silence, not working without reaching out on either side. We're so much stronger that way. Our kids are changing their habits and their attitudes. The kids surprise themselves by trying and even liking vegetables that they would never touch before. This is blurry, but that's a nori roll. How many of you have eaten seaweed? How many of you have eat, seen a seven-year-old eat seaweed? All right, pretty good. <laughs> Parents tell us that their kids are now cooking at home and prefer healthy foods. Teachers report, guess what? changed behavior in the classroom and better attention spans in class. Everyone is paying attention. Solutions to obesity have to be holistic, right? Because our strategy and our passion are powerful, we're excited to say that we've become a national model. We'll talk about that later if you want to. With White House encouragement, we've expanded so that every child in America can have access to our proven curriculum. We won't stop pushing forward until every elementary school has hands-on nutrition education, until it's just as cool to eat healthy food as it is to guzzle a soft drink. You know, it was a mother's instinct and my passion for food that compelled me to create Recipe for Success and train the food consumers of tomorrow to look past the marketing hype, read the label, make informed decisions, 
reclaim the wisdom of their grandmothers, and celebrate their cultural legacy through honest food. It's our responsibility as individuals and as a community to take back the dialogue and reframe the critical issue of good nutrition. We each have the power to drive change in our own way. What's your passion? What's your passion? Physical activity. Physical activity. What's your passion? <laughs> Healthy, food. Healthy food. What's your passion? Physical activity and healthy food, that's me too. How are you gonna use your passion to save our kids? There is so much to do, as we know. We need to hold food companies accountable for making nutrition information easy to find and easy to understand. We need to make sure all neighborhoods have easy access to fresh, affordable food. We need to support local farmers and the infrastructure they need to stay in business and promote the farm to school programs like you guys have launched right here in Missoula. We need our schools to serve even healthier lunches. I would, I would challenge the schools to serve even healthier lunches than the new mandates. Why not? We need to remove competitive foods that don't meet nutritional guidelines. We need to encourage the increased consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables, remove soda pop, and pl provide plenty of water. We must bring teachers and administrators on board and work together to ensure that the culture of health permeates our campuses with effective nutrition, with effective, uh, not only education programs, movement breaks, and PE. At the same time, we need to encourage families to be more active, right? To eat healthier foods and spend less time in front of the TV. We need to educate our parents and caregivers with simple steps and information with calories displayed on menus and nutrition information on the front of the box. We must insist that advertising Ooh, that's a bad slide. The advertising to kids be controlled. Let's get those toys out of fast food meals and junk food out of the social media. You know they're circumventing us now because on Facebook and, and on all the social media sites, they're promoting music. If you buy, you know, you get a free uh, ticket to the concert. If you turn in your um, Burger, Cream, Burger King, uh, all kinds of ways to circumvent what we know about TV. We need to get junk food out of social media, out of cartoons, out of games. We need to ban neuromarketing from food ads for kids. Our government, as you know, both federal and state, is stepping up with the tools we need to support our demand for better food at home and in school, let's move to take advantage of those resources. Let's move to leverage our community solutions. Let's move to educate our children from their very first bite, to pay attention, to ask questions about their food, to be empowered consumers. From the beginning of time, it was food that drove us from our caves to explore the world. Food fueled trade. It pushed people to new realms, to new awarenesses. Food even drove the discovery of America. Columbus was looking for spices, not tomatoes. Although Europe was happy he found those tomatoes. Now it may be food that's killing us. It really doesn't have to be that way. Today we'll be packed with powerful ideas and inspiration for changes you can make happen. You can make happen. You can make happen. Right here, at home, in school, 
statewide, citywide, countrywide. There is so much to do. Pick something. Pick something that matches your passion and get after it, as we say down in Texas. Make a difference. Seven years ago, I said, I can do that. And I did. You can too. Thanks. Good morning. First and foremost, I'd like to uh, thank the planning committee and their invitation. Um, I'm feeling right at home here. I, uh, I'm an honorary Texan, and actually, um, I grew up in the state of Maine, and I'm, I'm finding it very similar here uh, to some of the experiences that I had in Maine. Uh, when, you, when the snow flies, we put on another layer and we head off to the slopes and we go outside and it's an opportunity for us to play. In Texas, sorry Gracie. <laughs> things are bigger and better, some things, in Texas, but uh, we can't drive in the snow. Um, we cancel everything when, with one flake of snow and so um, even, when it, even when it rains, we, we really struggle. So. So I'm feeling right at home, so thank you very much for having me and, I, and I'm highly appreciative of that. The one thing that you didn't hear in my introduction was this notion of um, all the job titles that I've had over the years. And so I've been a physical education teacher, I've been a health education teacher, I've been an outward bound instructor, a coach, uh, a school administrator, an athletic director, uh, a camp counselor, a personal trainer, and a professor. One of these days I'm gonna get a real job and, uh, and kind of settle in on here, but one of, the, one of the takeaways from that is whatever needed to be done was what I jumped in and, and, and involved myself in. Whatever could get children active, whatever our community needed at that time. And I think you're gonna hear some of that in, in this new world of research that uh, I've been kind of part of for about the last 10 years here. I think one of the things that I'd like to do with my presentation is, is draw on some of the information that you've heard from the first two presentations. So I'll try to insert some of their messages. But in addition to that, I want you to have a takeaway as an adult, as a leader, on your own brain health and cognitive health, because that's really important. So not only has a sedentary society manifested um, poor physical health, but it's also manifested poor brain health. And our, our food consumption has done that as well. Um, literally, we have transformed the function and structure of our brain because of some of the food that we've consumed and the fact that we don't get out and we're not physically active anymore. So it's a takeaway for you as well as some of the things that are certainly listed on this slide. Let's talk about schools today. How many of you are employed as an educator? Raise your hand. Okay, hands down. How many of you are parents? Okay. Great, thank you. So the one thing that we need to understand is that schools have changed since we have been there on a regular basis. And the graph that you see here is evidence of our focal point on academic achievement now. This is how we measure school success. This is how we measure a child's success, is how well they score on a standardized test. And right here on the graph, this is the amount of money that we've dedicated to that phenomenon. And on the bottom here is what you see is the test scores over the years. <laughs> so, you know, I think the message, uh, uh, as Susan suggested, is really simple. Are we investing our money in the right places? And if we actually invested it in physical activity programs, in healthy food service, and provided these opportunities for children, changed our physical, um, change our physical environment, and change our culture, as both Mark and Gracie have suggested today, instead of investing in more testing, we may actually get some movement on this achievement line in a far more positive manner, but that's where we're at today. 
Okay? Schools are under a tremendous amount of pressure to make very difficult decisions. And I'm not here to say that you shouldn't choose the new reading program um, over recess or physical activity. What I am suggesting is that administrators have tough choices to make, and I'm empathetic to that. And so I'm hoping one of your takeaways is now when you speak up and you act out, you know what to say at that school board meeting. You know what to ask for at that school board meeting. Well, we've already heard all of the data um, about obesity and the trends that we have here. I'm gonna borrow a slide from our friendly neighbors from the north, okay? We actually don't have one of these slides in the United States quite yet, although my understanding is N. Haynes is collecting the data as we speak, and pretty soon we'll have a slide um, that's similar to this. Um, let me give you some of the information and then I want to know whether you think the United States will perform better or um, be slightly different. This is the phenotype of a child. And so if we look across on some of these categories, it's based upon a 1981 and then all the way up to the data were co collected across 2007 and 2009. Um, boys are an average of 11 pounds heavier in Canada, and 11 pounds for the girls and 14 pounds for the boys. They're less fit, they're also a little bit taller. So these changes in our human evolution of we had to be hunter and gatherers, in this particular case, we are no longer that. And this actually makes me think of the movie Wally, -E, you know, where all of a sudden you don't need arms and legs anymore, you just kind of look like a giant jelly bean, okay? And are we headed in that direction? Um, so the phenotype has really changed, and some people are like, oh, do we really have data and information that this is happening? Yes, it's real. Now, that coincides with this, honey boo boo <laughs> on TLC. And for those of you who don't know, she was on Toddlers, I hope I get this right because I'm not really a fan, but she was on Toddlers and Tiaras and then now she has her own spin-off, um, this family that lives in Georgia. And they are actually sensationalizing this notion of plump is pleasant. And uh, their food consumption is whatever they want and apparently, the show has really taken on a bunch of momentum where they, they had uh, piloted uh, the show and now it's, it's this reality TV is actually about the acceptance of this phenomenon of our phenotype changing. So these kind of trends in our culture um, make me a little bit nervous that reality TV is driving our behaviors in some way, shape or form. This problem is complex. It's about, for children, it's about motor skills. It's about their self-efficacy, their perceptions of, well, am I a basketball player? Am I an athlete? Can I engage? And, and the answer is yes, of course you can. And you can do that. But somewhere along the line, children lose that sense of invincibility, right? We play, we can do it. I'm the best. I won. I'm the world champion. And then all of a sudden, whether it's at eight, nine, or 10 years old, well, I didn't make the team, or I can't participate anymore. Uh, I'm not an athlete. And we start to relabel children and we lose that invincibility. And you know, that invincibility used to last into our 20s. Um, and for some of us, it's still you know, going on. The one thing I wanted to get at here is when it isn't a positive physical activity experience, we increase, and there isn't regular engagement, we increase the risk of obesity. Um, we actually, when we increase the risk, uh, risk for obesity, instead of having a healthy brain, it's actually turned upside down, okay? And I'll, I'll make more sense of that as we go a little bit here. So um, I'm gonna give you some basics on brain health here real quick. What happens is a child actually has a fully adult weight brain at about the age of seven. So sometimes when we think of, sometimes when we think of children, oops, stuck. Sometimes when we think of children in that five to seven eight, uh, age, Span. Um, they try to do a sit up and they still have that head lag. 
<laughs> do the sit up. You know, well, it's okay when the infant's only three months old or a month old and they have that head lag, but you know, this notion of a head lag when you do sit ups um, really is this notion of they don't have the abdominal strength and their brain is actually of an adult weight at that particular time. Although it is completely unrefined until about age 21. So even though we have the size, and the potential structure in place, this refinement continues along this continuum all the way from the back to the front. So if you take two hands and you go like this right here on the base of your brain in the back, that is actually where the cerebellum is located. Okay, hands down. That helps you with muscle coordination and it's one of the regions to first develop in the brain. Think about it, it makes sense. A child will crawl or creep or roll to get to that couch and all they want to do is pull themselves on that couch. They're working on refining that gross motor skills so that motor coordination develops next. Okay, take your hands, go from the cerebellum and a little bit higher right in the back. Some of you may have a bump there because mom and dad, you know, had you sleep on your back. Okay, hands down. That there is actually your occipital lobe. Your occipital lobe is responsible for vision. If you go a little higher on your head, that becomes the parietal lobe, which is spatial orientation. That spatial orientation connects with vision as well as the auditory from the temporal lobe. Then we have the, pre, the frontal lobe and the prefrontal cortex. So what happens is that development goes from back to front. And as we see with our color here in the blue, all of a sudden there's this refinement and activation. So if the brain is always underdeveloped in childhood in those different stages of development, you know, why is it that teens still make these dumb choices? They don't wear seat belts, they engage in risky behavior, they consume the food substances that they want. Well, actually, they have a good excuse. And their good excuse is the fact that their prefrontal cortex is, is the last to develop and actually is responsible for decision making. So that notion of judgment and, and proper decision making is the last thing to be developed within the adolescent brain. So they try to push us away, they don't want us anymore, but it's actually the most important time for us as parents and as educators. We still have to model the ideal behavior. We still have to support them through the decision making process because the brain is still under development. Okay, one piece of bad news for all of us in this room. So you are at your cognitive peak from about 21 to 29. <laughs> and at that point, it's all downhill from there. So quite often I travel with my graduate students because I forget what I'm supposed to say on the next slide. There's really good news that you can make a difference and you can start to stave off the effects of dementia by increasing your engagement in physical activity today. You can make a difference. Whatever you're doing right now, if you can take one more step, take the stairs one more time, you can actually improve your cognitive health. And we have quite a bit of robust data with, with the older adult population. So let's make comparisons across the lifespan and, and how do we know that we actually have this brain health and cognitive health? Well, for adults, um, they have uh, quality of life. They're functional. Um, they remember where they park the cars, their car, where their car keys are. They um, remember how to make connections to, uh, on their to-do list, what is important. Um, and I'm finding with every, every passing day, I seem to have to write it down now instead of um, just remembering it cognitively. But in children, it's a little bit different. It's about attending school. It's about how we process that information. And of course, as educators, our academic achievement. So there's slightly different paradigms there, but in essence, we're talking about functioning at a level um, that demonstrates some sort of efficiency and some accuracy and some speed of processing, as you hear some of my examples. 
two emerging areas are the ones below called cognitive control and cognitive flexibility. And so let me give you an example of that. Um, what does a green light mean? Say it nice and loud. What does a green light mean? No. What does a red light mean? No. What does a yellow light mean? No. <laughs> I always love the person who shouts out from the back, drive faster. <laughs> okay, you leave here today. And as you're driving out the drive, the parking lot, the pickup truck in front of you has the tailgate down, they accelerate from the stop sign, and a bucket bounces in front of you. You now need cognitive flexibility to dodge the object that's in the way. Let's change the scenario a little bit. No longer does green mean go. Green means stop, and red means go. Now you have to drive home. That's called Inhibition, you have to inhibit your impulses, like our attention deficit children. You have to determine what's the most important piece of information, and you have to inhibit these other impulses to behave in a different manner that's inconsistent with what you want. We do this to children in schools a lot. Here's some novel content, here's a new piece of information, and we do, it to, and we, we do that to them in six straight hours, which sometimes are predominantly sedentary places to be. Okay, we don't let them get up and move around and think about it and process it with their bodies. Some, some great teachers allow that, but not all. <laughs> So for children in school, these were children um, in Illinois. And uh, what happened was we were looking at their ISAT test scores, which is a combination of their reading and mathematics scores. These are third and fifth grade students. On the bottom axis, what you see here is how many times they appeared in the healthy fitness zone for each physical fitness component that they were tested in physical education. So it could be push-ups, it could be curl-ups, it could be the pacer test. So the more healthy fitness zones that they scored in for each out of the five tests, the greater the likelihood that they were gonna score better on their academic achievement test. Okay, what a beautiful graph. This has actually been replicated, and I think you're going to hear from Stephen this afternoon about some local data, and this has actually been um, replicated in about 30 studies across the country now. Massachusetts, Texas, I'll show you some Texas data in a minute, um, California, uh, Georgia, all of these places has produced similar data. Here's something important to keep in mind, is that fitness is a trait and genetics influences that trait just a little bit. Physical activity is the behavior that we engage in. But not all of fitness is about genetics. We can actually change the fitness of children, and we'll talk about that in a minute. These are some of the data that um, were produced from the Texas Youth Fitness Study. And what they actually found um, in, in several of their associations is not only better academic performance, but a greater likelihood if some, a child is physically fit that they will attend school. Let's face it, they're not in school. That is lost learning time. And for many school districts across the country when a child does not attend, it means lost funding. Okay. so. Every time you have a child not there or a teacher who is absent, they end up getting less um, money back from the state because of the attendance. It depends on your funding formula, but, but it does happen. One thing that I really liked about the Texas Youth Fitness Study is they started to account for things like SES, um, racial differences in makeup in the group, how children are at de de different developmental stages and different ages, um, and they accounted for all of these things, and the fitness effect still holds true regardless of these other variables. So it wasn't necessarily about what neighborhood someone came from, but it was about their physical fitness and getting them there. They also looked at uh, delinquency and school attendance, and again, those children who are fit um, attended. Now sometimes we get ourselves into a chicken egg here, right? So these are just correlational data and these are associations between the two. So if you're physically fit, you're more likely to attend school. 
However, we could say it the other way around. And from the standpoint of if you have this academic achievement, you know that you should engage in physical activity and try to improve your, your fitness. So we don't really know which came first, fitness or the academic achievement, the understanding of how to become fit. So we're gonna address that in some of the data that are coming up next. And how we're gonna do that is we're gonna look beyond just the paper and pencil tests and the practical situation. And what we've done is taken subgroups of children from that authentic context and brought them into our lab. And we've looked at something called the event-related potential. And it's just like your green means go example. So we present a, a stimuli to a child, which could be a cat and dog that's on the computer screen here. They have a response control pad, like a gaming pad, but it just has um, uh, three buttons on it. And then we utilize here what's called an EEG cap. The EEG cap have, uh, has electrodes, but it doesn't mean that they get shocked with the electrodes, okay? <laughs> We're not talking about 1950s scientists here with the Bobo dolls and hitting the Bobo dolls with a, a hammer and see how the children's response. It's actually a salt water conductivity and this is basically like a swim cap on the child. And what's nice is it produces not only these brain waves, which you might see in um, an ECG or a cardiogram, electrocardiogram, what it does is it allows us to measure the response time, the, action, the accuracy, and also the functionality of the child as, as they are presented, these stimuli. So the very first simple task is simple. 80% of the time um, the dog will appear on the screen and 20% of the time the cat will appear on the screen. And they have to respond when they see the cat and then we reverse the directions to elicit response. What we're trying to get at here is what kinds of decisions do they make, children make, are they accurate decisions? So think about that, it's just cat and dog on the screen here, but really we can make inferences to some of the health decisions that they make because what we're looking at here is how children recruit portions of the brain to actually um, make, uh, how much information they can utilize to make decisions about uh, what they eat, um, wearing their seatbelt, and things like that. We also look at arrows and directions and ask them to do that, and we really mess with them here in that they have to read the sight word, they read the color ink, and then all of a sudden here, instead of reading that word, you have to identify the color that's on the screen. And so it really makes you stop and think and slows down your processing. And we call that an incongruent type of task. So back in 2005, we wanted to compare children who were still under development with those college age students who were really supposedly at their cognitive peak. Now what's the difference between being at your cognitive peak and um, that processing speed or your reactivity um, when your brain is still under development? And I'll tell you why this is important. Because a lot of times administrators are like, you know, Darla, that's great. That's great that you know that information. But in our school, in our situation, we still, it's not necessarily about reaction time and it's not necessarily about um, uh, accuracy in the task, but I'll tell you how to make that connection. So if we look over here, this is like a golf score because it's reaction time, so lower is better. And our adult responders who are at their cognitive peak respond in a very similar fashion. Here we have our high fit and our low fit children, and what happens is those unfit children who also in this case were um, overweight and obese children are very slow to respond and process information. So not only do they have the social um, issues that are going on in relation to their body type, but they have processing issues and they're very real. And they're mechanistically um, undertaken. It's not just social in this particular case. And then what we have here is when children became fit, they were just as accurate as the low fit adults. And this is really important because every year in a school curriculum, we add new information. Let's face it, history is longer, 
There's a new technique for literacy. We now have language across the curriculum. We have character education. And schools are responsible for all of this. You have a 25 pound bag of rice for your curriculum and we're trying to put 50 pounds in that burlap sack. So if children can process information faster and more accurately and they can get it the first time, think about what we can accomplish in schools. Think about how we can have our troops um, more prepared um, to fight not only because of physical health but because of cognitive health as well. This is your brain on fitness. <laughs> this is your brain on sedentary or inactivity. So one of the questions that I always get, it, this is the nose and the face up here. This is back in that occipital lobe. Remember it was a very visual task, cats and dogs in the task. And you see that fit children are recruiting from different regions of the brain. That's neural activation. They are firing more neurons to try to solve that problem. But yet their peers don't, yet their peers don't do that. Okay, so there's just a distinct brain health disadvantage for those children. Then we replicated this a few years later. We said, what if we make this, take it from a visual task to something that's a little bit more spatial oriented, something that involves um, some noise and animation as well, and you still see that fit children recruit, have greater neural activation, they have great faster processing speed, and much more accuracy when we have the task. And this holds true and transcends into the classroom. They're better learners. So to kind of solve that issue of is it because they're fit or is it because they're well educated, what we do is um, create some sort of treatment where we generate the fitness effect in the children. And we were fortunate to have an opportunity to have an after school program. We called it the Fit Kids After School Program. Um, Everyone who signed up for the program was either sent to a wait list control or participated in the physical activity program. That program had an instant activity, um, some fitness stations, an educational component, a healthy snack, and in addition to that, they did have some by choice sports skills um, that were inherent and in, in part of this program. So. We didn't cut our program off at six weeks or 12 weeks or a semester and say that that was enough. Um, we followed them for an entire academic year after school and then we followed them for the next couple of years after that. So we wanted to know if we did have sustained effects. This is basically a comparison study between those children who go home and sit um, because that's the only opportunity that they have versus children um, who had a physical activity program. Um, and we also had things like homework help and stuff in there. This is our group that went home. Their fitness actually went down even though they were growing and maturing and usually aerobic fitness and strength improve. Just because you're a year older, that means that you're stronger. But that didn't necessarily happen in this case. Um, so their aerobic capacity um, actually reduced. And then look what happened to um, the aerobic capacity of those who had a physical activity program every day after school that had about um, 75 minutes of, of physical activity involved. Again, we make a comparison by the body weight and our faster responders um, and the healthy weight. Um, and in this case, this is accuracy on this line. And then we make a comparison by whatever the cognitive task is, whether it was pictures or it was arrows or it was cats and dogs. We do see some similarity right here on this particular task. But in this task, where it's an incongruent task, you have to rethink the directions. We've changed the directions. We've changed the circumstance. Then we see differences between those of a healthy body weight and then those who are not of an unhealthy body weight. Again, we took it across um, several different tasks and you see that in almost every situation the group that had the physical activity after school um, out cognitively outperformed everyone on those tasks um, except for this particular five letter memorization task. 
So after one year of being part of this physical activity program, we see this is where both of the groups were on the pretests, very similar activation. And then look at the activation here after just the choice that these parents made were to have their child enrolled in this physical activity program um, versus going home. And so what we're trying to make is some inferences about how much screen time um, they actually engaged in here, what kind of food did they cons uh, consume when they went home, did they watch TV, and on top of that they had an unhealthy snack, and, and make some inferences for about how, how should we act if we know that these are the benefits. If we know that this is going to happen, um, then how can we ensure that it's going to happen? So these are your talk points that you're going to take back to administrators, you're going to take back to the school board, that children who are physically fit, children who are engaged in physical activity, they have a different brain function and brain structure. And there's greater neural activation uh, for those children who regularly engage in physical activity and ultimately are physically fit. We've heard about this notion of cardiovascular disease and the precursor to cardiovascular disease, and we call that metabolic syndrome. And I actually have to tell you a quick story here. When we were, we were doing a health screening, um, the first time, Gracie, I had heard six years old with disease, um, we were doing a health screening. Uh, we had an African-American male who was 11 years old, um, as thin as a rail came in, um, and really um, had no not been to, had a primary care physician and not gone to that primary care physician on a regular basis. And what we actually discovered uh, is a family history for high blood pressure. And on top of that, because of the dietary habits in the family, he also had high glucose. So sometimes this notion of metabolic disease is not necessarily as obvious as looking at the phenotype and how the phenotype has changed. And um, your notion of the silent killer is exactly that. We had an 11-year-old who was very active, but in addition to that, um, he just didn't have that profile or that look, that body type about him. Um, and through our uh, screening, um, we actually were able um, to try to get him some help and some counseling. Um, in these other data sets, one from Massachusetts and another one from Illinois, uh, they screened large numbers of children, 200 children and 500 children respectively, and what ended up happening is 50% of the population was risk-free with regard to metabolic syndrome. The other 50% of the population had anywhere between one and five risk factors already there. Okay. And we're talking about children who are anywhere from 5 to 10 years old, already had multiple risk factors present, um, and, and the same thing is reflected in that particular data set there. So we took this notion of risk, of risk, and we compared that risk to their cognitive performance, and we wanted to see if there was any association between the two. So if you have high blood pressure, if you have elevated CRPs, if you have elevated glucose, now remember, most of us should have got this screening, our first cholesterol screening when we were about 20 years old, okay? And what these last few slides that you see almost suggest that this should be a screening as we enter into the school environment. Okay, and as we enter into the school environment, we can identify your level of risk and correspondingly act appropriately. And maybe, maybe you need a 504 and another health impairment right away. Um, maybe you just need to be, have daily physical education because your risks are low. And what we discovered here is that the greater the risk that was there, the poorer the performance um, on the incongruent tasks, on the color word task, Trails is nothing more than tracing a dot to dot as fast as you can, finding the object in space and then moving um, towards that object. So what we have here, okay, and here is that um, children with those risk factors, again, were outperformed by their peers who did really well. So sometimes I get the question of, um, you know, how does one session or bout impact uh, all of these things that you're talking about, Daryl, the metabolic syndrome and risk and brain health and your ability to have cognitive function? And, you know, don't children just walk from class to class? And isn't that enough? 
And the, the answer is, in short, it's not enough. If we're thinking about 60 minutes each day, the only place that some children get to contribute to that 60 minutes is during the school environment. As we saw, we had a large group of children who went home um, and sat in front of the television and were not afforded an opportunity or did not walk or bike to school uh, and have an opportunity to be physically active. So here are some practical takeaways. So when we think about these bouts of uh, sessions of physical activity across the school day it could be recess, recess before lunch, is this the recommendation? Drop in activities. So let's not forget about um, our secondary students. They may not have recess. Does it mean that they, just because they walk from class to class, they shouldn't have a chance to be active? Drop ins are an open gym in the morning that they can come and they can walk, they can shoot baskets. During their noon hour lunch, they can go into a courtyard and play frisbee. Um, they can have an open gym in the afternoon or an open fitness room at the high school where everyone has access to these facilities before athletic programs have access to these facilities. So think about it from, from that standpoint. Across the curriculum, where can we steal some time to provide physical activity opportunities, and are they beneficial? In this study, we had ch some children, uh, half of the sample, um, start by sitting for 20 minutes, and we had the other half of the sample walk on a treadmill, and then they counterbalanced the effect. Some went into sitting, and then some went into walking. And again, we have consistent data here that just, this was 16 minutes of light walking can actually increase your, the attention of children. To me, it was the recess study. In addition to that, teachers matter. Teachers matter. There was greater energy expenditure among these children who participated with some sort of physical activity leader, whether it was a physical education teacher or someone and stood up and actually led that physical activity. They expended more energy, okay? And there were cognitive differences across the trails and across the color word conditions again. So they expended more energy while they were doing a dance that was led by a dance instructor. And here, opposed to active gaming. Is active gaming better than nothing? Yes, probably. Probably. It's better than sitting on the couch. So engaging in that active gaming, using the Wii, using the Connect Xbox 360, that there did lead to some energy expenditure, but the human element was more powerful. Okay, all of us getting out there and leading that activity and doing that activity with them was more powerful than them standing in front of a television and actually doing the gaming. So what's the ideal dose then? If we, if we all want cognitive health and brain health, what is the ideal dose? Well, the ideal dose is probably going to, is something that's going to take me for the rest of my career to identify um, because we're all slightly different as individuals. And what we do know is that, that gaming activity does not have the tendency to burn or expend as many uh, calories as it would for some sort of traditional activity. And it could be we had basketball, we had dance, we had um, just tag games, and we also had fitness stations in there that we were making comparison to. We tried to match them with a game. Another thing that we also know that it's important, if we think in terms of frequency, intensity, time, and type. They seem to have slightly different effects across brain health. So for example, sometimes people hear this presentation and say, the next time we have standardized testing, we're gonna do jumping jacks, okay? Out of the blue, in the classroom, the teacher then has everybody engage in jumping jacks, and then they sit down, and then they participate in that particular academic achievement. Not the normal routine. 
So what we need to do is rethink that and have that become the normal routine from the standpoint of let's always have physical activity in, in the school environment. Let's change what we do. Let's have tread desks. Let's sit on physio balls. Let's use foot rollers. Physio balls are the big bouncy balls, using those as chairs. Foot rollers is nothing more than a bar where the children can slide their feet when they need to slide their feet just because they have to get the wiggles out. So there was one child who was really struggling. Um, we were trying to determine if he was e exhibiting autistic tendencies in a local school district. And he would lean across the, the group of four desks to get the teacher's attention. And the three other students would kind of, who had their desk there, would kind of lean back. And, and he would raise his hand and he would be lying on the desk and he'd want um, her attention. And then what we decided was he just needed to get the wiggles out. Okay, and now that I've met Mark officially, it's probably... <laughs> It was like Mark, he just had that pent up energy. We gave him a foot roller on the bottom of his chair. And just by subtly changing the school environment, by changing the culture in that school that it was okay for classroom teachers to have physical activity in their classroom, um, it actually, uh, several of the students, in addition to this one student I had observed, um, they began to thrive in that environment. So, if we think in terms of do dose, is the duration is 20 minutes, 40 minutes, 60 minutes better? Well, what we know is 20, 40, and 60 are better than none. We know that. Okay, what we also know is that if there's a little bit more time, um, 40 minutes over 20 minutes, there seems to be a slightly uh, additional benefit to that. When we get to about 60 minutes, 40 and 60 minutes don't necessarily seem to have a difference between the two. So does five minutes of standing at an easel in the classroom and acting out poetry, is that going to impact your brain health? Yes, yes. Would it be even better if we could increase that intensity just a little bit? And when we increase that intensity, engage in things like dance or juggling or even a greater expend energy expenditure of being part of a walking club? And the answer is yes, the benefits seem to be proportional. How long do they last? Okay, do me a favor, stand up. I want you to stretch over your head, and then I'm going to give you a countdown to sit down. Okay. I want you to reach down. Okay, then the last thing I want you to do is big inhale, fill the lungs with air. Give it a try. Now exhale. Okay, take a seat right where you are. There are two things that just happened. Number one, I reset your attention, okay? And the gentleman in the back row who was, okay? You now with me? Just, just kidding, okay? There are some multiple benefits. Number one, to reset attention and then now allocate, refocus that attention on the appropriate task. The second thing is we've changed where blood flow is regulated. Okay, it has a tendency to all of a sudden move away from the brain and that gravitational pull gets soaked somewhere down into your feet and it doesn't have benefits. So even activities as simple as that can be beneficial to brain health. They can be beneficial to children's behavior and attentiveness and less delinquency. So here's a huge talking point. Children are more likely to be on task if you give them opportunities to move than if you ask them to remain in chairs the entire time. So your classroom teachers will be like, I'm really nervous about getting them out of their chairs. I'm going to lose control of my classroom. The bottom line is you're going to lose control if you don't. Okay, so here are some of my takeaways and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some teasers for this afternoon and, and some of the models that I've been working on around the country. 
Number one, this notion of the activity, 60 minutes of physical activity, most of it being moderate to vigorous. I have no evidence to suggest that that's inaccurate in any way. That's the best recommendation and I um, would certainly um, suggest adherence to that. It does not have to be large chunks of time. We're talking about a total of 60 minutes to moderate to vigorous. The other thing that we need to think about is the type of activity and the type of cognitive tasks. Many um, schools are actually using morning wake-up assemblies. Everyone in the school, either by way of the video cast in their classroom, does the physical activity, or they come to the gym and they actually have a morning wake up physical activity. California schools, so lucky, they've actually been having celebrities <laughs> come, and outdoors in their pavilion or in their green space, they have their morning wake up physical activity. So we have to think of, that is the, way, the best way for us to start the day. What should come next? And I'll tell you, as long as we've had breakfast or we've had grab-and-go breakfast and we've had that physical activity, the next thing is either reading or math. And then after that, our really rigorous academic stuff should come next. Then after 60 minutes, we should have a five to 10 minute break. That five to 10 minute break should be physically active in nature. Children should be allowed to get out of their chair, not just to get a pencil or go to the restroom, really engage in learning at the end of those five to 10 minutes. And then after that, we should hit the next academic subject hard. Our specials, art, music, and physical education need to be part of every day, if we can get them in there because of scheduling, they should be in the afternoon because they are stimulating of the brain and it has that built-in stimulus and response. Okay, hit the academic stuff really hard in the morning. So ultimately, someday I'll have my own school here. And we'll all get together. And the last thing is, let's not forget this notion of play, and I think we heard it from Mark um, this morning. Uh, children have a right to hang upside down on the monkey bars during recess, <laughs> right? Because there's social ramifications, that's something that they may want to do. Let's not make all of our programs completely rigorous that we have a jersey, we have a number, we have a step count, and we have a designated energy expenditure to, to it. Children need to be curious and play and come up with their own rules for that game. Um, paint lines on the playground and then see what happens. That creativity will emerge. Children who have lines on the playground um, will engage in more physical activity. Uh, peaceful playgrounds is another initiative. So across the country, like you are moving here in Missoula and moving across Montana, um, the Let's Move in School logo, we have taken an approach where it's a comprehensive school physical activity program approach. It begins while children arrive to campus. So they walk or bike to school. And then across the curriculum during the school day, when can we find times where they can be physically active? So not only at recess, but in the classroom. Can they learn content through moving? Um, can teachers provide incentives instead of saying the birthday party today is mom or dad brings in a cake or cupcakes, it's a popcorn party but it's on the move. Or we earn the right to go to the gym or we earn the right to be outside. Or maybe we've earned the right for a local bike um, shop to bring in some bikes and we learn how to cycle in the afternoon. Staff involvement, let's not forget the health of our teachers and let's not forget to train our teachers. Let's make sure they have an opportunity for wellness and put our wellness policies to good use and pull them out of the filing cabinets. The star of the show is physical education because it's one of the only places where children receive formal instruction and in how to be active and the benefits of that activity after school and before school and this extension into the community. Joint use agreements, family fund nights, um, getting the parents involved in the child's education, all of those things are part of this model. And another thing that we have been uh, moving towards is acknowledging the physical education teacher whenever that's possible, and I realize in some instances it's not. 
um, because a physical education teacher may be shared across different schools, but acknowledging them as the director of physical activity and we're providing training on a national level for those individuals to organize these experiences. Here's a bag of equipment for fourth graders for recess. And then we have now have YMCA is coming in after school and they're doing their active six program and that has been highly successful for our sixth graders. It's those types of things that the physical education teacher as the champion would facilitate those relationships. And the last thing I wanna just tease you with is this notion of physical literacy has begun to emerge. And actually, um, the Canadians went first, so our neighbors to the north um, were actually the first ones to coin this term and its importance in school. So they've tied physical literacy to learning standards um, to actually try to facilitate, bridge this gap between <laughs> physical activity Physical, physically active children, physically fit children are going to do better in schools. They're more ready to learn. And a lot of times the literacy, the last piece to literacy is you embody these behaviors yourself. You don't just talk about where we have access. We don't just understand the benefits. We don't just provide opportunities but we get people to embody and embrace this. Okay, your questions that you need to ask yourselves and your reflection and your takeaway. What can we do as policymakers? How do we speak to policymakers? How do we utilize this information? Um, we have busted some myths today about what we know and how brain health um, can change over time. And, and certainly, um, I thank you all for being here today and I challenge you to carry out these, these tasks. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Darla. Um, well, from building and improving sticky environments to shortening the distance between food to plate to increasing physical activity and education and promoting physical literacy in schools, it's, it's been a busy morning. Um, all three of our morning speakers have agreed to come up and take questions in the few minutes we have between now and lunch. So are there any questions? Maybe there yeah. are there questions. Right, first I should ask is, are there questions? Can we go Can we? out of the building now? Do you, do you know everything you need to know? Oh, we have one. I'm, I'm curious if like, you think of the SPARC research that shows having yeah, I'm, I'm highly, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, so the, the question was um, my uh, interpretation of the SPARC research and uh, were you specifically asking about zero hour PE and things like that, having it in the morning? Uh, all of the data that I presented today actually support that. So um, a morning assembly of physical activity, walking or biking to school, a zero hour PE before school for your secondary students, all supports the notion of this increased readiness to learn when you all of a sudden get to your academic content. And that's part of the reason why I made the recommendation. Have your breakfast, be physically active, and then hit the math or reading pretty hard. Anybody else? I forgot to announce that all of the PowerPoint presentations will be available on the Let's Move website and we will send you that link uh, to access them after the summit. So, oh wait, we have a question. Whoever it is, I can't see you, ask, yes. There's one there. Right here. Oh, Minky. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask any of the speakers if you have, uh, if you're aware of or studies on the connection between obesity and children from low income and uh, hungry families. If you see data on the relationship between food insecurity and obesity and also related to the neighborhood state. I think we can probably all speak to that, but I'll step up first. Um, our um, colleague wanted to know if we were aware of the research connecting uh, obesity and hunger 
and food security in our neighborhoods. Um, as you've probably all read, the obesity explosion in our lower income neighborhoods tracks right along with starving kids. And part of that is informed by the quality of the nutrients that they're taking in. So because um, um, low quality, low nutrient foods are very inexpensive and prolific in these neighborhoods that have been identified as food deserts, our kids are eating that food, that dollar meal, and not getting the nutrition they need, so they're still hungry. They're eating and they're still hungry because they're not getting the vitamins and nutrients that they need. So it's a, it's a double track and it can be addressed by many, in many ways. Mark talked about the built environment and the new rules about, yeah, where was it, LA? No more fast food restaurants. I mean, this, is, this can be approached from so many directions, not only the built environment, but making fresh, affordable produce available in these neighborhoods, easily available, affordable is the key. And that can be um, engineered through robust farm to school programs, robust farmers markets and after market programs for farmers markets. A lot of communities are uh, implementing mobile markets to go to the community. A lot of communities, the, the health clinics are implementing farmers markets at the clinic. So hand in glove with that has to go the education of how to prepare these foods. So we're seeing in the larger uh, urban environments that you can't just give them the food. You have to show them how to make it. So that's from my perspective, but I'm sure you guys. I'll just I'll say one more thing. Uh, my charge today was uh, to discuss physical activity, but we certainly could present a whole body of data on under uh, nutritious um, Situation. So, for example, um, not having enough calories in the system, not having the right type of food substance in the system will actually inhibit cognitive control. So you, your response time when something goes out in front of the car and you need to make an adjustment very quickly, that response time would be re reduced. And thinking about a child who didn't eat dinner the night before and then comes to school and is not offered school, f school breakfast, I mean, the executive function is almost to the point where it's non-existent. There isn't judgment and quality decision making there. So um, the data are certainly are, are emerging and um, there's enough evidence to suggest that the support of school breakfast, you have to have that, everyone has to have that before we start the school day. Yeah. I'll give you, I'll take it in another direction because there's some really interesting stuff going on looking at interact, like at the more at the community level, systemic level. So one interesting study I didn't show you today compared the density of fast food restaurants and car ownership and um, obesity risk in, in various environments. So they, they made sort of a, a quad grid, if you can imagine. You could either live in a low a, a neighborhood that didn't own many cars and didn't have fa a lot of fast food or did have a lot of fast food. So you can imagine the, the best circumstance, lowest obesity rates were among neighborhoods with a didn't own a lot of cars, but there weren't a lot of fast food restaurants. Not non-car ownership, you can imagine, although it's a proxy for income, suggested people were walking and or taking transit more, right, if there aren't as many people owning cars. So not owning a car would have seemed beneficial. Now, you move to owning a car and you see obesity risk go up. So once you get a car and can drive everywhere, not shocking, right? Also not surprising, if you go from owning a car to in a low fast food dense neighborhood to a high fast food dense neighborhood, lots of fast food restaurants, obesity risk goes higher still, right? Not surprising. Here's the interesting one. Now shift from high fast food density but not owning a car. Obesity risk should go back down, right? Well, because, okay, I've got bad food choices, but at least I'm being more physically active. What, in fact, do you think happened to the data? That was the worst scenario. So being in a neighborhood where you had low rates of car ownership and high fast food density, which would be our lowest income neighborhoods, highest risk of obesity because now you can't even escape the crummy food choice, right? You don't have a good food choice. You're essentially in that environment and you're trapped there because you don't even have a car to get away from it, to get to the, the, sh the, the, the store that's in the wealth, you know, the nice Whole Foods or Trader Joe's that's on the other side of town. 
So we're, you know, this idea of, of, of separating the nutrition and the physical activity conversation I think is absurd and the most compelling research is happening where we're starting to look at them both together. Um, we can also talk about some really interesting the research that's starting to happen. Our housing partners are looking at things like we make a neighborhood more walkable and desirable, put in a neighborhood park, add a, a bike lane, things like that. What happens to the housing values? They tend to go up, it becomes more desirable. We have a phenomenon we're calling gentrification, where the very people that we were hoping to help are now pushed out because it's too expensive, it's too valuable to live there because it's so desirable. So now we have to start to realize that our partners in this work have to be things like the housing authorities that help us think about maintaining affordable housing stock in even our most challenged neighborhoods as we make them more walk and bike friendly, give them better transit service, make sure there's a good grocery store there and a farmer's market there. So, it suggests to you that our partners are much broader than just those of us that can think about physical activity and nutrition. We need transit authorities and we need housing folks and all sorts of people if we're gonna think about those social equity questions that I think you very rightly raise. It's really important stuff. Okay, and I know under the glare of the interrogation lights, there was a question over there. Yes. Um, I heard of positive outcomes for adults who stand more than six throughout their work or school day. And I wondered if you know of any research uh, for children who are standing more than sitting or if that's doing but an option in school um, you know, to have standing stations. So I think the question was about um, it, is there any research that's a, about standing stations in schools and the benefits for children? And uh, the answer is um, it's being conducted right now. However, I'll point to one study. Um, Joe Donnelly did a study where he did physical activity across the curriculum where the children every 60 minutes had a five to 10 minute break and he did this over a three year period of time. And um, body weight went down, aerobic fitness went up and academic achievement went up in everything except for spelling, and we haven't figured out why. <laughs> so that's a little bit different. It's a little bit more energy expenditure than standing, but, but certainly we are expending more energy by adjusting our posture here than we would be by slumping in a chair, or we could also expend more energy by sitting on a physio ball, and we're on the verge of about to publish some of that information. One more question before we break for lunch. Yes. Uh, could each of you mention maybe three or four American brands, consumer goods companies that you think get it? Um, maybe not just through manufacturers, but uh, companies that are in the physical fitness space, equipment space, uniforms. I mean, just have at it. I'm not sure we can, I can do three, but um, the, the, the question was, can each of us mention three United States companies who get it and are making changes in their environment and in their products in order to um, meet this issue head on? This is counterintuitive, and I never thought I would hear myself saying it, um, but I've begun saying it more and more. It's interesting that Walmart is taking um, a lead in not only um, injecting the organic uh, food production business with the support it needs to become viable on a broader scale, that's a little counterproductive, but counterintuitive too, but uh, overall good, and putting in things like solar roofs and that sort of thing. But we're starting to see, I'm, I'm uh, active um, on a city level in my city of Houston, uh, there's a very proactive outreach to uh, businesses to um, focus on worksite wellness. And BMC Software, a, a lot of particularly software companies are very cognitive of this and, and building uh, health awareness into their corporate culture, making it a systemic thing, the same way we're trying to do it in schools. I think it's something that you're going to see emerging over time. Frankly, I have not seen any of the big food companies um, take a real lead. I've seen a lot of what I call nutrition washing. A lot of, uh, I, I was there when big food uh, stood up on the stage with the first lady and committed to um, front of package labeling and all the, all the things that we were asking them to do with uh, the Let's Move movement. 
um, just very enthusiastic about it. And then literally, I feel like they left the stage, they circled around back, they hired the heavy, heaviest, dutiest lobbyist in town and spent, have been spending millions in do of dollars to fight us at every turn, with the exception of Walmart. So there are surprises everywhere, right? That's all I can say. There's always hope. <laughs> um. So I'll go kind of a different direction and sort of, I, it's funny, I have a different view about Walmart only because I'm continually fighting with them about, can we bring the building up to the street? Will you put in bike racks? Will you? And, we made them do that in Vermont. And they're starting to, that's right. Well, go to Rutland, Vermont, and, uh, and it's, it's right. in the downtown in an old mill building, not on a new box out on the edge of town on, a, on the strip where the homes and Home Depot and Lowe's is. It's enormous. And by the way, the farmer's market happens in their parking lot. So it can be done, but you got to put them in a headlock to do it because they still have the standard Walgreens. You remember my Walgreens story? They'll come in with the standard template unless you put them in the headlock. Um, having said that, I love the notion of Trader Joe's. One of the interesting things about it is they do 40,000 square foot stores rather than 200,000 square foot stores that can fit back in a neighborhood again. So there are some models that are evolving of, of, of the retailer that will go into a more neighborhood walk by like transit oriented setting. Um, and I think we use that as leverage to get these guys to continue to play because you're absolutely right. We, we can get them there if you push them. But I'll give you another brand, totally different, different world. Trek Bicycles has a one world, two wheels campaign and it's very much about bikes for people to ride to get places. In other words, not everybody wears Lycra, not everybody's ready to go up to the single track, unbelievable killer mountain bike trails you've got outside of Town Hill. Some people want a bike that they can just ride on the bike trail along the river to get to work every day because they don't want to spend five bucks on a gallon on gas. Trek is seeing that and is moving in that direction. So, you know, when you're thinking about your next bike, at least give a, you know, look at some of their products in that context. Um, uh, there's another company called Bixie that is making the shared bike systems that we're seeing get put in in cities and towns across the country, the ones with those kiosks, you swipe a card or have a fob and the bike is released. Really cool stuff. And uh, let me go in a totally different direction. The insurance industry is in a broadly a varied readiness to respond to this. Some of them are still doing it the same old way, just increasing premiums. But there are places like United Healthcare that are actually making high deductible plans available. And if you live a healthy lifestyle, if you meet certain performance standards, they'll let you work your deductible down by having, you know, by improving your blood glucose profile, your BMI, your cholesterol profile. So they're rewarding people for healthy behaviors. Kaiser Permanente is launching an Everybody Walks campaign at the national level um, that is about building building communities where it's easier to walk and bicycle. So, uh, but I don't, but and, uh, the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Minnesota doing great stuff. I've also with, worked with blues around the country that are still completely in the box. Um, I would urge us all to look for insurers who are responding to this because we need the healthcare and insurance agencies to recognize it's about the root behaviors, nutrition and physical activity. And if they can be, reward us for healthy behaviors, they get the outcomes that they're looking for, which are fewer, fewer expenditures in healthcare. Um, so there are, are brands and institutions that are thinking about this stuff. Sure, I, I have two right off the top of my head and one is hot off the presses. So last week I was in Washington DC at the Gen Youth Conference and the NFL has brought forward to the table money for children to be physically active. Now it initially started as fuel up to play 60, but now they're talking about money for research and development and to create coalitions and partnerships across all the organizations that we run in to try to address these issues, bringing them to the table at the same time. And that was their big announcement last week. So let's hope that they really follow through on this. But the, the fact that they do have the financial means to make a difference and that it's not just about football and recruitment for football, but I really heard it was about um, a, the next generation being healthier and living longer lives. The second thing is Nike also released their own socio-ecological model which talks about the development of human capital which is very different than just tapping into that high performance market. So I, I think those are two companies that are starting to get it um, although uh, they, it's still under development exactly how they're going to carry these things out. We, we are going to break. Thank you all panelists for taking questions. <laughs>